Um, I'll just make sure I know what I'm doing here. <laughs> um, yeah, so this talk is not just the audio technology, but we're talking about a whole heap of um, technology that's being used across the whole global range of the Australasian bitten. Um, and so we're solving the challenges and puzzles of this highly cryptic and endangered bird um, using technology. And uh, the first thing I have to say is that this paper obviously has been written by a number of people here. Um, so myself, John, Alan and Sarah, we're all working in the southwest of Australia. And then uh, Emma's working in New Zealand, um, Matt and Andrew in uh, Eastern Australia. So there's, so th and they represent a whole heap of other people. We have hundred of, hundreds of volunteers like Plaxi and Lou, who are also helping the project and uh, there's other researchers as well um, where Jim Lane's here somewhere I've noticed him um, so yeah so we're just I'm up here but I'm representing a lot of people so the first puzzle for some of you who are not familiar with this species is who is the Australasian bittern and you can see the Australasian bittern here I hope I can figure out the button where are we Yep, no, I've done the wrong thing. <laughs> oh, there we go. It's the Australasian bitten on the right here, and the bird that looks most like it is the juvenile Nankeen night heron. And there are thousands of Nankeen night heron um, just in the Perth area, um, whereas in Western Australia, there's probably only about 100 Australasian bitten. So you're most likely to see a juvenile Nankeen night heron with this big yellow eye, lots of streaks on the breast, lots of spots on the wings. Whereas the Australasian bitten has a small eye, this beautiful white cheek patch. Um, the streaks on the breast are, are broader and less of them, and the mottling on the wing is much less pronounced. So while they look quite similar, there is quite um, noticeable differences. So the reason why this species is such a ch challenging species, um, the first thing is that it's very cryptic, um, and the second thing is there's not many of them around. So you can see in the um, photo there, this Australasian bitten standing out in the open, which is quite unusual for them. They're often um, deep in the sedges and rushes. Uh, this one's in the open, but still it's hard to see against that vegetation in the back. So it's a cryptic plumage and it has cryptic behaviour as well, so they're hard to see. The other thing is that there's not many of them. So we're looking at a global population of about 1,500 to 2,000. So in uh, Australia we had this estimate in 2010 um, which was up to about 800, but um, new data from the Bittens in Rice project on the east coast suggests that there's probably maybe the upper scale of that using the rice at a certain type of the time of the year. Um, so perhaps now the Australian estimate it hasn't been done, but it's possibly in that 700 to 1,000 mark. The New Zealand estimate is even older, um, but they are still happy that that's the sort of numbers that they have in New Zealand. So, so this is the reason why it is such a difficult bird to work with. In Western Australia, we have a small and declining population. So, um, so we have an estimate from 2010 of 40 to 155 um, adults over here in the West, strung out across this huge area. Um, and we're still happy with that estimate today that that's probably in the range that the numbers are. Um, and since the 1980s, um, we have lost about a quarter to a half of them. So they are disappearing. And you can see here on the map, which actually is um, the red dots are from 2007 to the present, not like what I've got there. Um, and the, um, the triangles and crosses are much older records and you can see that the red dots aren't covering too many of those old areas where they were. So what are the threats that's causing this decline in Western Australia? There's a number of those. Um, altered hydrology has been a big one over the years, particularly from agricultural clearing and um, urban development. A big one at the current time is climate change. As you all know, we have this drying climate um, in the southwest, 
And so that means that these um, very shallow wetlands that the Australasian bitterns use um, have less water in them, so there mightn't be enough water to breed in. Um, and then they're dry, they start to become drier for longer in the year, which uh, allows fires to come in, which just can destroy the vegetation and destroy all the little critters in there that the Australasian bittern are feeding on because they're predators. Um, so, yeah, so climate change is a big problem at the moment. Other um, habitat da damage, such as grazing and particularly salinity and acidity, um, they are also a big threat. And over on top of all this are uh, the introduced predators that we have in the southwest, um, along with uh, native predators like swamp harriers. And, and these eat either the um, birds themselves or their eggs. So. So technology is helping us to um, pull together some of the pieces of the puzzle and um, rise to the challenge of this very difficult species. So the audio recorders here, so we have a song meter two and a song meter four. They're pretty cool for um, learning about this species because while it's very cryptic and very hard to see, it's got a big loud voice. So, um, so we know from our research last year that the um, songs are from the birds um, on a quiet night and in a quiet location, like down at the Muir Unicat wetlands where bird life have been busily recording, um, those songs will travel for at least six kilometres. So, so song metres are just essential and we can um, survey a, lot, a large area in those quieter locations, not so good in urban locations, um, with those song metres. And the camera traps are also providing a lot of information as well. So the very first sort of equipment that we used were these uh, audio field recorders, um, but we don't use those anymore. Um, they were really good at the time, um, but, it, but for us these days, they, you know, you have to be with them in the field. It's very time consuming. So we don't use those even though they produce really good high quality recordings. What we are pretty much relying all our surveys upon are the song meters. Um, so the ARUs, as Sarah mentioned earlier, um, these are um, being used constantly. So I've had one song meter out down at Mu Unicup um, since September last year. I've been there twice to um, change batteries and cards and that will keep, um, keep us going until this September when we go down again. Uh, we're only recording for one hour and uh, the time that it's recording is an, starting from an hour and a half before sunrise, which I think all of you would be happy to be in bed while that song meter is churning away doing its work for us. So. So yeah, so they're great and um, just so good. The, the downside obviously is that we have hundreds of recordings um, and you have no idea of the direction of the birds. So if I have a song meter between um, three wetlands, um, we, we know there's a bit in there somewhere and it's probably actually using all of those habitats in those three wetlands, but we don't know exactly where it's coming from. Okay, so you've got all these hundreds of recordings. The next job, of course, is to find the bittens on the recording. So you've got three real ways of doing that. You could listen to that one hour recording and that's going to take at least an hour to listen to it. Um, but the way that we do it mostly is uh, manually scanning visually through the sonogram. So we put up um, the, the recording onto a sonogram and visually look for the calls of the Australasian bittens. So you've got one bitten here, which was probably over four kilometres away from the recorder, and uh, this one's probably within a one kilometre of the recorder. So three booms, and this one just happens to have four booms, but you can also see the gaffs, which are higher pitched, and some of the other higher pitch features up here. So, um, so that call hasn't travelled very far. The other um, way that you can do it is to um, use uh, automatic recognition software. You have to program the software to recognise particular sounds um, and then the program set up and it churns through the recordings um, and highlights where it thinks that it heard Australasian bittens. Um, the problem with that is that we're finding it's only picking up 75% of the bitten calls that are on a recording, which may mean if there's only one bitten calling on that one hour, it might miss it, you know. Um, and the other thing is it picks up a whole heap of other um, sounds that aren't bittens that takes time for us to look at. 
So um, as I talked about the booms and the gasps and, and things like that, um, this is a little research project that John Graff did as an honours project and this was looking at whether we can individually pick bitterns apart from their calls. Um, so just like uh, I might talk quickly and Sarah might talk slowly, then so too with the bitterns and I might talk with a higher pitch and um, Adam might talk with a lower pitch, then the same with the bitterns. So, uh, so this looked at um, uh, all recording over and over the same individual and another individual and then trying to pick them apart statistically from all those little characteristics of their voices. So it has um, some uh, promise for very small populations like we have over here, but there's a lot of um, problems that need to be sorted out. So the um, camera traps are being used in the southwest by Parks and Wildlife. Um, and like the ARUs, they're great because they can be out there for months um, and uh, they're collecting a lot of good information um, in the southwest about the foods that have been eaten in those wetlands, the predators that are using that habitat, and obviously if there's a photograph of a juvenile bitten, then we know that then there's been some breeding success. So there's some good information coming out of that. This is really new um, technology that was trialled at the beginning of this year um, in the rice fields in um, New South Wales. So thermal drones, which is like bitten spotto, and um, it actually did find Australasian bittens in the rice fields and it um, possibly can assist with um, learning more about breeding success and wetland habitat use. Satellite tracking and radio tracking has been done um, for a while in New South Wales and particularly in New Zealand. Um, and this is joining the dots between all the wetlands that they're using or in radio trackers, the parts of the wetland that has been used by the bitterns. Um, it's really providing a lot of information about both long, long movement patterns and short movement patterns and the parts of the wetlands and which wetlands are being used by bitterns. So in summary, um, the uh, technology is all helping to solve all those little pieces of the puzzle. Um, it's also improving our uh, monitoring really well by improving the efficiency. And uh, all of this information that we're learning um, can only help with future conservation efforts. If you want to help today with some um, bitten conservation efforts, you can buy a calendar at the back. Valerie will be happy to sell one to you. Or you can buy Australian rice as well and really help the Australasian bitten. Thank you. Thank you.